So welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Aid and International Development Forum. Thank you very much for tuning in. So, and my name is Pedro Costa. I'm, I'm the, I'll be hosting this, uh, this webinar. I'm the, the ADEF's conference producer. And today you will hear from uh, Niara Abliamatova, and she's the Chief Procurement Office with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, Jacqueline Enstone, and she's a contract specialist with the UNICEF Regional Office in Bangkok. George Gigalia, Regional Procurement Office for Asia and Pacific with the World Food Program. I would like to quickly remind everyone they can submit questions using the, the questions box on your screen and we'll uh, try to get through as many as possible after we've heard from our panel. So, Niara, hopefully you can hear me and um, we're going to pass the controller on to you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for introducing, and it's a pleasure for us to uh, to be here today and um, uh, talk about United Nations procurement. I'm, um, as Pedro mentioned, my name is Niara Vremitova. I'm um, a procurement officer and will um, represent United Nations Secretariat Procurement Division today. We are based in um, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, in uh, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, UNSCAP. You, you are welcome to um, to raise questions, and uh, we will answer it um, um, on the way we go. I will talk about uh, the um, the way you end as procurement and uh, the ways you can uh, cooperate with us. Okay, the United Nations is made up of a variety of the um, organizations and entities, funds and programs, specialized agencies, uh, secretariat, and in secretariat we have uh, UN office, uh, offices away from headquarters, uh, commissions, tribunals, and um, of course um, peacekeeping missions. Each organization has its distinct and separate mandates um, covering political, economical, and social, humanitarian, and, um, and other fields. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the UN Secretariat procurement and how to do business with UN Secretariat. And our colleague, my colleagues will cover um, other areas of um, the funds and programs. Basically, each organization, as I have mentioned before, has uh, its own specific requirements for goods and services and this is very important uh, uh, to note that um, we all follow the same uh, UN principles and public procurement principles but may have some differences in the way we do things. Also of course uh, each organization has its own um, uh, characteristics, portfolios, etc, uh, etc. Et right? Well talking about the principles of UN procurement, so procurement activities in uh, UN system are based on the following principles. Uh, these are the, um, the fairness, integrity and transparency, effective international competition, best value for money and of course the uh, objectives and needs of the UN organizations. And uh, these principles uh, are covered through all stages of the procurement process and uh, we, we make sure that uh, starting from sourcing to execution of the procurement contract, uh, the principles are, uh, uh, these principles are fulfilled. We get uh, very often uh, a lot of questions on um, what these principles are, and um, I will uh, talk shortly about uh, a few of them. Um, when talking about the best value for money uh, for the organization, we um, we're not necessarily uh, focusing on the uh, lowest initial priced option. The recent trends is uh, that we're looking at more at the life cycle cost, at the TCO, life, uh, life cycle cost of the equipment or services. Um, we're looking at the combination of the different parameters such as quality, uh, such as social, environmental, or other strategic objectives of the organization. And um, uh, depending on uh, whether we we are procuring goods and services, so you would see different technical parameters that will meet this best value for money principles. When talking about fairness, integrity, and transparency, we make sure that we give um, uh, the opportunities to all interested parties. We do highlight also the principle of the effective international competition here. Where possible, um, we do um, uh, involve vendors globally and um, uh, on a timely and adequate notification on the, from, from UN on the require, upcoming requirements, right? Um, 
we also make sure that um, the process is transparent and we have certain mechanisms and tool, tools for vendors also to address uh, the issues and questions when they have um, after or during the procurement process. <clears throat> Well, well, talking about the interest of the organizations and organizational objectives, uh, we do involve this principle a lot, um, especially at the humanitarian em emergency situations. This could be one of the examples. Uh, based on certain um, situations of life and death, we, we could actually uh, waive certain uh, uh, waive the competition, for example, or um, uh, go through certain ways of um, um, doing uh, procurement, overriding some standard processes to, to enable urgent action which will uh, save lives of people. Uh, here on the screen you can see the areas of operations. Um, in Asia Pacific we have um, the office, UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, UN ESCAP, where, um, where I work and um, this is the uh, one of the also biggest office and we do a lot of procurement from here and supporting our HQ in New York offices in Geneva and Vienna where we need to, to do procurement here. Um, UN ESCAP procurement unit um, also apart from supporting the um, the UN ESCAP mandates and its programs and activities we do support and uh, procure things, goods and services for other UN entities in Asia Pacific. Thus, we're very familiar with the challenges um, we have in the region. UN Secretariat is uh, one of the biggest um, procurers in UN system. Based on 2015 statistics, we are the um, second uh, largest procurer. And uh, our volumes in 2015 um, were um, uh, about $3 billion. Um, and as you may see, the trends are more or less at the same uh, level, so sometimes it's less and more, and it could depend on different factors. Talking about the measured goods and services, um, the UN Secretariat is procurement, you, uh, procuring. You could see that air and transportation services, chemical and petroleum products, food, uh, rations, catering services as, uh, are the key areas that uh, UN Secretariat is procuring. And um, of course, that uh, a lot of these items relate to the peacekeeping uh, missions and operations. We do a lot of uh, architecture and engineering and construction um, uh, work, works and services. So we procure a lot. We procure a lot of telecommunication equipment and services. We do rent and lease premises, equipment. Uh, we do procure a lot of uh, computer information, information technolo technology related products and softwares. Um, of course, vehicles and uh, transportation equipment is something that, uh, that could be listed in the uh, top uh, commodities the UN Secretariat is uh, buying. Well, talking about the, um, the tender process, the UN Secretariat, uh, we have the following procedures. Uh, depending on the uh, value of the procurement activity um, and um, whether it would be considered, and I will explain let, uh, later, uh, whether it is um, a request for quotation and uh, more informal process, which we consider goods and services below 40,000 fall under the informal procurement process and uh, go through less complicated procedures. Everything that is above $40,000 um, it falls under the formal procurement and we do it through the request for proposals for services and invitation to bid for goods. So talking about the formal uh, typical tender process which you, you could see on the screen, usually we start from the market research of course and uh, many of you could see uh, in the United Nations Global Market or, or uh, in the website of United Nations Procurement Division um, the expression request for expression of interest or request for uh, information. So this is the way we we come out to the market. We, um, we post globally uh, our requirements and uh, we do the uh, uh, massive outreach to engage as many companies uh, as possible who would be interested to do business with us at certain requirements at certain region. 
And um, uh, this is an opportunity for companies at this particular stage, actually, to uh, come back to us and say, say yes, we want to bid, right? So uh, at this stage, the buyer, procurement staff, uh, who is responsible for uh, for the procurement processes, are compiling the list of invitees. So uh, basically, this list of invitees. Uh, would com would be comprised of the companies who express the interest, who directly uh, send us a request uh, with the interest to bid, and of course we're also doing some uh, market research, outreach, and um, we're using United Nations Global Market as our key database, and I will talk about it separately later on the requirements. So this is um, mandatory for UN Secretariat uh, vendors to be registered at the United Nations Global Marketplace. So after the uh, request, uh, after the market research stage is completed, uh, we're working on the issues of the solicitation document itself. Either RFP, request for proposal, as I said, ITB, invitation to bid, or it could be request for quotations for lower values uh, below 40,000. Uh, we do have a stage of the bidders conference where, uh, where the companies and bidders uh, have uh, an opportunity uh, at the form to, to formally request clarifications, come for the site visit where it is necessary, and to get the uh, answers, and uh, be given an ov overview of the procurement process and advice on how to submit bids and uh, be answered questions and concerns that you have. At this stage, uh, we may sometimes have certain amendments to the uh, solicitation documents, uh, and of course, all questions and answers and any changes uh, during that stage to the solicitation documents are communicated usually to all vendors who are participating or who were invited to participate in the bid. UN Secretariat does have uh, does have a public bid opening process. We have a separate independent bid opening committees who are receiving the bids and then uh, who are opening it uh, at the public forum. So uh, for the public bid opening, uh, we invite all bidders who actually bid it, right? Who, who submitted their bids. Their representatives are welcome to come for the public bid opening and uh, observe the process of the public bid opening. We also have um, separate technical and financial evaluation teams. So these teams are evaluating your technical proposals, and then separately financial proposals, and then uh, we have a lot of committees and um, internal approval processes depending on the complexity and value of the procurement requirement that uh, we would need to go sometimes through the local committee on procurement, which is an independent body, or headquarters committee on procurement which is also an independent body, who will review the whole process and make sure that procurement was done within following the principles, or which is fairness, integrity, transparency, best value for money, interested organization, etc. Right? Um, contract award stage, which may involve negotiations, which may involve uh, the um, uh, consultations with legal office. Uh, United Nations has um, standard Contracts for goods, uh, services, and goods and services. We also have uh, the standard general terms and conditions for, for each contract. These documents are reviewed by our legal office in New York, uh, which are standard, approved, and uh, in very rare cases we do changes uh, to the general terms and conditions, right? So that is why we release this document at the bidding stage so that the vendors are aware of what what we will ask you to sign, right? What general terms and conditions we have and what we expect uh, from you in this regard. Also, the uh, vendors, um, they have um, a public platform where you could raise your concerns and challenges. With regard to the procurement process as well, um, we have probably bidders who are upset with the results all times and uh, they're asking for the um, uh, formal debriefing process or um, raising um, procurement challenge request, right? Which is also possible and there is a pilot project in United Nations Procurement Division where uh, contracts over $200,000 
uh, are subject for this debrief, formal debriefing and procurement challenges process. We are governed by the policies and uh, procedures, of course, Charter of, or Charter of the United Nations is our key uh, document, and um, which comes to the financial rules and regulations. This is a very thick document covering a lot of aspects of uh, UN financial uh, the, the way you, you on financial regu regulations and basically United Nations procurement manual is uh, our guide right which which is based on the of course financial rules and uh, the Charter of the United Nations all these documents are public documents and uh, you can access it anytime uh, via United Nations website uh, you can find it on the United Nations procurement division website and get yourself acquainted with how UN Secretariat does business and uh, what rules do we follow. Uh, in terms of the procurement methods, I already touched based um, on quite a few topics that you see on the screen. Uh, expression of interest, as I mentioned, uh, this is a time when vendors can actually respond to the uh, request for expression of interest and uh, participate that they express their interest to participate in the solicitation. Request for quotation is um, the informal, procure, uh, informal uh, method of procurement in UN Secretariat. Via this method, we usually procure good services in civil works, uh, which are valued between 10 to 40,000. Invitation to bid and request for proposal is the formal uh, method and uh, everything that is above 40,000 uh, we do through uh, through invitation to bid or request for proposal depending on the nature and complexity of the procurement activity. Talking about the um, types of solicitations and the thresholds that I have mentioned uh, in the previous slide, uh, the uh, request for quotation which is below 40,000 usually is a simplified procedure, right? So we uh, do often approach the local uh, local markets, while for the formal procurement processes above 40,000, the, the requirement is uh, to conduct an international competition. There is a minimum of 10 bidders that we need to uh, invite for the solicitation process. We have a public bid opening requirement in this, uh, in this case, right? And uh, we are obliged to advertise our, our uh, expression of interest for the particular activities above 40,000 on, um, on the international websites. And uh, we do advertise it, as I mentioned earlier, on the United Nations Global Marketplace, at the United Nations uh, Procurement Division website. Here in Asia, we also do it at the UN SCAP website. And uh, we also use the local newspapers, uh, depending on the country we, um, we are targeting. Sourcing of vendors in UN Secretariat uh, is an important uh, part. And we were very glad to have this opportunity to speak up to the market and to the, uh, to, to the business uh, people to actually explain how do we source uh, and uh, where can you find an opportunities with us. Because we are interested in getting more suppliers and getting better competition and giving opportunities uh, to a new companies to be on board and offer their services and goods. A few years ago, United Nations Global Market became the uh, only solar vendor database for the UN Secretariat procurement entities. And um, that is why you would, uh, those of you who had an experience with us, most probably were, was uh, asked by uh, procurement offices to get a registration with the United Nations Global Market. United Nations Global Market would give you an opportunity not only to be visible and have uh, business and work with the United Nations Secretariat, uh, but also to, to work with many other UN agencies. And in my next presentation, we'll explain more on, uh, on how many agencies are involved there, how many suppliers, what opportunities you will have there. We also have, uh, of course, we're using the expression of calls for expression of interest, which we, we are trying to advertise in the media, in, uh, in different websites, and uh, we do talk to our colleagues in UN missions who did similar activities before. Uh, we used the previous past performance of the vendors as well as different ways of outreach and market research, right? Uh, using internet websites, uh, using uh, outreach to, to the uh, member states, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, um, I will talk quickly about the uh, evaluation methods. What, what methods of evaluation do we apply um, in UN Secretariat? Well, uh, for goods, which uh, where we usually involve the request for quotation uh, method or invitation to be uh, to bid. Request for quotation is we use for the simple goods and services uh, below forty thousand, and invitation to bid either uh, straightforward services uh, and uh, goods over forty thousand. So the technical evaluation in this case is based on the pass fail criteria. The criteria for awarding the contract is the lowest price technically compliant and responsive offers. I would like to stop here at the, the technically qualified and responsive offer and explain a little bit uh, here, right? So, as I mentioned already, for goods for uh, ITB and the RFQ, uh, we're looking at the lowest price. But we're looking at the lowest price among those who are technically qualified and responsive offers, meaning that when you would see the, the invitation to bid, we usually give you an idea on the evaluation criteria. We list our evaluation criteria, and we say that these are criteria we're gonna uh, we're gonna utilize at the technical evaluation stage. So we encourage all bidders to really look at this and uh, make sure that you meet this criteria because pass fail criteria are yes no criteria, right? So you either you either pass it or fail it, even. Among, even if among 10, 12, 15 criteria, you fail one, you will not be considered as a technically compliant bid, and thus will not be uh, further evaluated financially. This is very important to, to take note on, uh, to, to, to make sure that your, your, your bids um, to UN um, are uh, successful, and you, you, you don't spend time on something that you may not comply with, right? So when evaluating the services via request for proposal, request for proposal is a formal process which involves complex services or works, construction services, uh, over 40,000. So here we're using the scoring system and uh, we, we do not have only pass-fail criteria, but in addition to the pass-fail criteria, you will see the scoring criteria. So the highest overall cumulative financial and technical score will give us uh, the idea of the um, of the company who will be awarded the contract right so here we're looking at the combination of the technical plus financial components and the companies who are getting the highest score would be awarded and recommended for award and here it's not necessarily that that would be a lowest priced bid that would be the bid which would give the the uh, best value for money for UN. We call this principle as best value for money principle when we evaluate we evaluate the RF. Okay, just to give some ideas on the bid evaluation criteria, and uh, the list you see on the screen is not an, an exhaustive list, of course. So I have I've been talking about the scoring technical criteria and requirements, and each bid would have these special instructions to bidders, which will list this, the technical requirements, right? When you, you will be able to match your company's profile uh, capacities, capabilities with these requirements. We also do look at the um, acceptance to UN payment terms. UN has the standard payment terms of uh, 30 days post payment. Uh, very important to note that we do not make any prepayments. In very exceptional cases we do that and that's subject to separate uh, negotiations uh, but we have a 30 days post payment terms and uh, we're paying based on deliverables only. The goods delivered, accepted by UN, payment made. Services delivered, satisfactorily accepted by UN, uh, we make the payment. The contract templates, as I mentioned before, we have a standard contract templates, we have standard terms and conditions of the contract which our legal office has issued. We do ask in, in many cases, uh, especially when it in, involves engineering, construction, um, architectural uh, design services for certain level of liabilities to, to, to cover ourselves, professional liabilities, general liabilities, of course, 
delivery terms, we use Inca terms. Uh, technical supporting documentation is something that also we're looking at, right? And uh, this is where we, we see that bidders uh, have challenges preparing. Sometimes this uh, the process is quite cumbersome, right? We, we do accept uh, bids in English language only. And this is also one of the challenges we have in Southeast Asia region and Asia Pacific in general. Not many companies, and they, they address these issues, have uh, capacities to prepare the complex bids in English. Uh, even to go through the registration process in the uh, United Nations global market. But unfortunately, um, English is a working language in, uh, in this region and we do require the, the submissions in English. Warranties, conditions, and other criteria which affect the, the success of, of your business. As I mentioned earlier, the registration in the United, United Nations global market it is mandatory. The next presentation gives you a brief overview. We also have the online applications. So uh, now the um, you could uh, upload app on uh, your Android or iOS uh, and have notices and procurement procurement notices in your uh, in your uh, telephone and you will be able actually to even submit your expression of interest via uh, via phone this is in terms of the recent developments you could see the uh, the website uh, on the screen the procurement division website we encourage you to to visit and get more information you will find here the business opportunities, all the expression of interest and upcoming tenders and procurement plans for all secretariat uh, procurement entities all over the world. Uh, you will find statistics, you will find, you will find instructions on how to register, how to do business uh, with UN, as well as uh, how to to request for the, the briefing sessions, you will find more a lot of uh, interesting information there. So working with the vendors, we also also mention about uh, UN Global Compact initiative. Those of you who didn't uh, hear about the global uh, UN Global Compact, it is a group of businesses which actually care about how they could do business better, how to to meet the uh, principles of the uh, nowadays world. But uh, there are 10 principles uh, of the uh, UN Global Compact, and uh, we also encourage our contractors and our vendors to familiarize yourself with the uh, UN Global Compact principles and become part of UN Global uh, Compact if you are if you are interested, if you have uh, if you have capacity, and um, keep these uh, principles in mind. Yara, th thank you so much. So now we will hear from uh, Jacqueline Enstone. She's the contracts specialist with a. Uh, UNICEF with the uh, regional office in Bangkok. Thanks, Pedro. My name is uh, Jacqueline Enstone. I am the contract specialist at uh, UNICEF regional office in Bangkok. Uh, I've been here since last September, so I'm also still very, fairly uh, new to the region. Thanks to uh, Niara very much because, in fact, uh, Niara has uh, presented a great presentation. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a presentation. But you'll probably be happy to hear about that because actually most of the information that Niara has explained is actually very relevant to how UNICEF does business as well. So I'll maybe uh, quite sh much shorter than uh, Niara, maybe explaining some of the differences of doing business with UNICEF and doing business with the UN. So uh, UNICEF, as you may know, is the United Nations uh, Children's Fund. We uh, were set up 70 years ago, and we're working in 190 countries and territories throughout the world, primarily to, to protect the rights of every child. Um, we basically believe that all children have a right to survive, thrive, and fulfill their potential to the benefit of a better world. You can uh, find out much more information about UNICEF on our website. I'll, I'll go through in the same order as Niara's presentation uh, so that you can maybe note down some of the differences. In terms of the principles of procurement, uh, as Niara mentioned, UNICEF also has exactly the same uh, principles, public procurement, in that we are looking also at a fair and transparent competition, economic and efficient process, best value for money principle that Niara went into detail on, and also obviously meeting the uh, best interests of uh, the organization of UNICEF. What do we buy? That's also slightly different uh, from that of uh, the UN. We uh, spend approximately 3.4 billion 
on goods and services every year. We are uh, one of the main, if not the main, uh, buying entity of uh, the United Nations uh, entities. Our main procurement is on vaccines. Uh, we're one of the major world procurers actually of vaccines. We also purchase huge quantities of pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, education supplies, therapeutic foods, vehicles and IT equipment. But in, it also purchased the whole uh, range of uh, non-food items, nutritional supplies. We do a lot of construction services, international freight, water and sanitation, etc. Uh, the tendering process is also very similar uh, to that of the United Nations Secretariat. We uh, have the expression of interest uh, proce process. We do not have the same requirements of the UN as um, being registered in UNGM for suppliers, although we are moving that way. And we would also, uh, we're also in the process of completing a pilot which favors um, registration in UNGM. And we would therefore highly encourage vendors to register in UNGM, at least at the basic level, because that will be the way that UNICEF will move forward in the future. We also have the same types of uh, bidding processes as the UN in terms of uh, request for quotation, invitation to bid and uh, request for proposals. Limits are slightly different. Uh, we have for an, a request for quotation process, our uh, limits are between $2,500 and $30,000. Our invitation to bid, the ITB process, is for um, a formal process also for goods primarily above $30,000. And the request for, pro uh, for proposals um, process is actually as of $2,500. So we're doing a request for proposals process for even for the lower value items and, and that's where we're looking for in general services which are either complex or difficult to describe. Um, we also go through a question and uh, answer session. Occasionally we also do bidders conferences depending on the requirement. Our bid opening, in general we don't have public bid opening processes. They may have them in certain offices but certainly in the Bangkok office and in certain other countries in uh, Southeast Asia we don't have a, a mandatory bid opening which is uh, open to suppliers. Um, and then the rest of the process is, is the same. We have our evaluation um, of the technical and commercial proposals. We have um, also a contracts committee, we call it the contracts review committee, the CRC, which is for awards above a certain amount, which is also an independent body which adjudicates on the co completeness of the procurement process. Um, and then we also have a, a contract award and a debriefing process, although not a formal debri debriefing processes. process. Uh, vendors can come back to us and ask us for more information why they may not have been selected, and we can provide more details as to why uh, that may be. So on the policies, procedures and guiding principles, our main uh, document detailing our procurement guidelines and procedures is our supply manual. Uh, we also have our own financial regulations and rules, our financial and administrative policies, and certain other, well, the, the guiding procurement principles, which is uh, what we've already talked about. Um, on vendor sourcing, uh, again, a very similar process to what Niara explained. We're also looking at uh, previous procurement exercises, uh, past performance. UNGM, as I mentioned, isn't necessarily mandatory, but we are using that database quite a lot, especially more and more as we realize that actually more and more suppliers are getting themselves registered in UNGM. So it's a very useful tool for us to see um, details of suppliers and uh, do our sourcing from uh, that database. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the internet for um, other sources and also comparing actually we're, we're looking to other UN agencies a lot there's a lot of interagency cooperation going on so if we do have a requirement for which we don't necessarily have uh, business in place we will actually contact uh, other organizations such as UNSCAP or UNDP 
or FAO and, and, uh, and in fact we do have a, a common procurement working group where we exchange information on cor common procurement projects which is also quite active here in Bangkok. Um, on the evaluation methods, I won't go into that again, we also have the RFQ and the ITB which is uh, adjudicated on a pass-fail basis. Um, and then the lowest, lowest cost option after um, for, for anyone that meets those criteria. Uh, on the RFP, we have the combination of the uh, technical and commercial scores. Uh, in principle, that is, we uh, award 60 points in total for the technical uh, proposal and 40 for the commercial proposal. However, that can vary depending on the uh, service that we're procuring. Procuring it may be 70 points for technical and 30 for price, or even in exceptional cases, there may be 80 points awarded to the price uh, to the technical and t uh, 20 for the price. So that will depend on uh, factors which are determined in advance. Uh, the bid evaluation criteria, yeah, that, that would be the same. As Nyara mentioned, the terms and conditions are extremely important for, you, uh, for UNICEF. Uh, these have already been uh, defined by our legal department in New York. It's very difficult for us to change those legal provisions only under exceptional circumstances where we've actually obtained the approval of our legal office. We would discourage that, that practice because it can be extremely time consuming and it will often end in, uh, in negotiated terms and conditions not being accepted. Uh, hence the reason for including the terms and conditions at the beginning of the process in the RFP documents or, or bidding documents. So it is important for suppliers to read carefully those terms and conditions at the start of the process to make sure that you can actually comply with those terms and conditions. That will uh, save greatly in time at the end of the process. I think all of the others uh, are the same. We've uh, Niara talked about the UNGM registration, uh, which uh, I would encourage suppliers to register and also um, to go on the on the site because there's lots of use, useful information on the UN uh, Global Marketplace site for for suppliers and potential suppliers. Uh, you'll learn a lot about uh, the bidding exercises that. Uh, many, many UN uh, organizations are undertaking. There's also very a uh, lot of information about um, how to better do business with us, what are our principles, how to do uh, look at sustainable procurement, uh, interesting uh, links that you can uh, get to from that UNGM site. We would also encourage uh, suppliers to uh, be part of the UN Global Compact. It's a very good initiative and we will be moving more in that direction with the sustainable procurement, etc. So it, we, we do encourage suppliers to, to look into that and, and to get involved. On the UNICEF website, you can find an awful lot of information about uh, who we are, what we do, where we work, uh, lots of statistics uh, which may be uh, useful for you to see whether or not UNICEF would be a, a good company uh, organization to do business with. You can also see a copy of our uh, annual report. I don't know whether we should go specifically into uh, what we're doing for Myanmar. Uh, perhaps I'll just mention briefly, I think that uh, my colleague Devika is also on the, on the call who's our contract specialist in Myanmar. Um, I'll just briefly mention for the benefit of uh, suppliers that may be listening that uh, the Myanmar country office pr procures high volumes of printing and we've recently uh, established long-term agreements with uh, six companies actually. Myanmar country office also procures high volumes of uh, wash commodities, so that's water sanitation and health commodities such as pipes, hygiene kits, water tanks, tarpaulins. Um, we also procured uh, commodities for a nutrition micronutrient survey um, and they also procure spare parts for vehicles, phones and other IT commodities um, as well as many services which are either admin related, training, event management, evaluations, uh, surveys, etc. So those are the main, uh, main commodities and services that are procured in Myanmar. Uh, on that note, I think that's uh, it from my side. Um, thanks for listening, and I'll hand back to Pedra. Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your uh, insightful overview. We're going to pass the controller over to uh, George because we're a little bit pushed for time. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I see we don't have much time, so I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Sorry for not having presentation. I am. Mission for the moment. 
So my voice might not be very clear also because of internet connection, but I hope it is clear. Um, uh, I will just introduce WFP. Uh, we feed 800 million beneficiaries. We work in 75 countries and we deal with uh, 3.7 million tons of food per year. Uh, so obviously all our business processes and everything else is linked to food aid and food uh, distributions to beneficiaries. Uh, but we, from these 3.7 million uh, tons of food, we buy 2.6, approximately 2.6 million tons. The rest is uh, donation in kind. The countries are giving us food in kind. The World Food Program is voluntarily funded organization. All our money is coming from donors. Donors are usually countries that give us give us some cash or in kind donation. In addition to this, uh, these figures, we are also doing cash transfers. We we're trying to give wherever its markets are developed and is possible. We're trying to give our beneficiaries money instead of food for them to buy whatever they require, and that reached this year approximately one billion dollars in distribution. As a regional procurement officer, I am having two hats. One is buying food uh, for internationally, for international deliveries, and buying non-food items, as well as supporting my, our country offices in the region. So I'll give you very brief statistics of uh, how much of uh, food and non-food items we buy. From Southeast Asia, WFP buys approximately 300,000 tons of food uh, worth of approximately $195 million. Uh, this food, the biggest part of this food is rice, of which 200,000 is exported to other parts of the world. Some part of this, uh, approximately 93,000 tons, is uh, procured locally in the countries of the region. Uh, one of the biggest countries that procures rice is Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar usually buys these days 12 to 14,000 tons of rice, in addition to other commodities, but rice is the, by far the largest uh, procurement of food. That's just about uh, food. Then we buy some wheat flour and some wheat in uh, Pakistan and Myanmar. Uh, sorry, Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are uh, Myanmar, Afghanistan and Pakistan are the biggest uh, food procurement countries for World Food Program in, in Asia. Switching to non-food items, WFP buys, as a, as a whole entity, WFP buys $500 million worth of goods and services, of which our region is buying approximately 34 to 35 million tons worth goods and services. The goods and services that we buy are we our biggest spend, unfortunately, is on security services. Then is the administrative administrative requirements and uh, rent. Then the next next category is vehicles, and the next category is uh, fuel, and also the logistic services. So these are the biggest categories that WFP spends uh, money on when we buy goods and services. Uh, goods and services processes are very similar to what UNICEF was reporting, so I will not repeat. The processes is exactly the same. For food, processes are a little bit different. We still go through UNGM, but we form the rosters of the suppliers. Uh, so we pre-clear the suppliers before we invite them to tender. So the UNGM indeed is only first step of registration. If suppliers want to register as food supplier, they need to register to level two supplier in UNGM. And then WFP will look at their records and decide to register them or not based on their certification, the quality of food they can supply, etc. There's lots of requirements. I, uh, I will not list all of them there, but if you're interested, you can contact contact us, I'll give you the email address a little bit later. So this is for food. Uh, for non-food items, indeed you can register on UNGM and then UNGM uh, depends on what type of contracts you need. Uh, on the basic level, first level or second level. Second level is usually for the suppliers that supply 
large uh, large items or large um, high value items or the suppliers who want to have long term agreements with WFP uh, vendor re uh, registration is a little bit different again because WFP only the for WFP mandatory is only to register vendors which are doing international procurement in UNGM whilst the rest of the vendors need to contact the relevant offices and register with each and every country office. We realize that this is difficult uh, because you need to really find all the contact details of 75 countries if you want to work with all of them. So we came up with one email address, which is newsuppliers at wfp.org. I will repeat, newsuppliers at wfp.org. Uh, where you can send your request and uh, that will be forwarded to the to the countries that you are interested in. Uh, WFP uses online tendering system which is called Intent. You need to register in Intent separately. So when you get when you get registered with WFP, you will get an email to get registered in Intent. And uh, then in Intent, you have two different processes for food and non-food for for non-food it's very similar to normal tenders that you've probably been uh, receiving by fax or by email uh, you just need to upload scanned document uh, with your offer for rfp there are obviously two stages where you up upload your technical document and your financial document uh, for food you need to uh, fill in the special table which will for us create the automatic evaluation table so that we avoid any mistakes on uh, on the price, retyping price in the evaluation tables. In addition to that, WFP has new trends. One of the trends on food is that we introduced long-term agreements for supply of food. Who knows food business knows it's not easy to introduce, but we managed to do it. Suppliers uh, who win this will win larger tonnages. So obviously we will have less, less contracts less number of suppliers winning the tenders and less tenders but then we will have more guaranteed supply yeah the last thing was the um, um, en environmental procurement which wfp is trying to do sustainable procurement to be more correct wfp is trying to do sustainable procurement from our region we buy lots of oil from malaysia and indonesia and we're trying to uh, only buy this oil but from the companies that ISPO certified. ISPO stands for Roundtable for Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, uh, so that the ISPO has its own certification process. So we we buy from those companies. Uh, also, the sustainable uh, procurement is not only related to environment but also social issues. And WFP is trying to buy from smallholder farmers in order to help them to survive in first place, but also to develop the capacity to, to sort of make their crops higher than they can do it now, yield higher, and therefore get more income. Uh, I am now actually sitting in India and trying to do exactly that, trying to help Indian government to work on this type of projects and uh, increase yield of smallholder farmers, which is like 70% or 75% of Indian farmers. So uh, this is in very short. I'm sorry if I missed something. Hi, George. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation and uh, for focusing on food. That was really, really great. Uh, again, because we're a little bit pushed for time, we're going to dive right into questions. Again, thank you so much for our audience for uh, submitting these. We're going to start with a question for Niara. And uh, it's from uh, Ellen, and she's from uh, Israel. And the, the question is, uh, do you use uh, integrity pacts? And why or why not? And uh, what are your safeguards against contact between bidders and the officials handling the tender process uh, in order to maintain uh, integrity? Yara? So we do have a, a very clear segregation of duties be between the um, procurement function and the requisitioning function, uh, not to mention the uh, the budget uh, function, etc. So basically, uh, we do not allow our acquisition as clients and uh, whoever who is not involved in the procurement uh, process, who is not a procurement uh, officer itself, uh, to uh, get in contact or in touch uh, with the um, with the companies during the solicitation process. Um, this is um, a very 
you know, this is a requirement that we also communicate to the uh, vendors so that they they are also not in touch with the with the clients as it may or with the with the requisitioners with the with those who actually. Uh, with drafting the scope of requirements, right? The, uh, these people uh, and the people who will be managing the contract, we call them clients or requisitioners, and uh, uh, the only uh, contact is a procurement. So this is how we, um, if if we uh, observe uh, there was a, um, uh, there was any um, any contact, um, uh, it may lead even to the disqualification of the bid. So this is how we, um, you know, observe and make sure that um, the process is fair, fair and transparent, and the integrity is there. I don't know whether I answered the question. Do you have any follow-up question on that? Thank you so much, Niara. That was. Great answer, and um, I think we have another one for you. It's from uh, Vincenzo, and he's from Italy, and uh, he's asking if you can you kindly explain the difference between ITV and RFP, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, ITB, invitation to bid, and uh, RFP, request for proposal, these are two formal methods of solicitation, which in UN Secretariat we use for uh, to to procure goods and services over $40,000 and above. So invitation to bid um, is uh, used mainly for goods or simple services for which we could uh, we could actually apply pass-fail um, criteria, which are very straightforward off-the-shelf services uh, so to say, and um, the the difference is that the evaluation method is a bit different from the uh, RFP. Um, as I mentioned, the evaluation is based on the pass fail criteria, and uh, the bidders who pass 100% criteria, so who are marked as they meet all the criteria which were listed in the invitation to bid, would be considered as a technically compliant, and we would select on the out of the technically compliant companies, only the lowest price one. While with the RFP request for proposal, we use this method uh, for for works for more complex services, which are, which are um, not quantitatively or uh, qualitatively, um, you know, identified, right? So where we would like to hear from the bidders maybe on some solutions to offer to us, uh, we would like to see what are the different methodologies we can apply here and there. So it's more complex process. Um, we involve scoring criteria. It's not pass-fail. It's, um, and the, the we award the contract uh, for the um, to to the companies uh, who actually get the maximum uh, points uh, as a result of the combined scoring system, the best value for money principles, where the technical plus financial component would uh, uh, would make uh, actually the uh, the decision. Thank you so much, Niara. We have uh, one here for um, which I think applies to uh, the, the, all three. Uh, UN agencies, and um, it's from Laura, and she's from Italy, and she's asking uh, which have been the implications for uh, UN procurement with the 17 SDGs of the uh, 2030 Agenda, and uh, if there are any relevant changes from the past. Well, um, of course, we. Um, I think uh, the the way forward is uh, UN is looking at the um, at the ways to do this uh, more sustainable procurement and uh, apply the um, the green procurement initiatives into the uh, into the procurement processes. Uh, we are looking at. Um, um, at um, uh, e-tendering initiatives in the Secretariat as well, uh, and uh, basically at um, uh, better ways to support uh, our operations in the field. That's uh, what I can say uh, at this point from our side. I don't know, Jacqueline, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, I can concur with uh, um, Niara on the fact that uh, UNICEF is also looking more and more at uh, sustainable procurement and how we can incorporate uh, uh, sustainable procurement criteria into the process. So in the uh, in the evaluation process, in the bidding process, and also in the contracting process, so that we can uh, ensure that our goods and services are procured more sustainably from a economic, uh, environmental, uh, 
uh, perspective. So we're trying to uh, reserve a minimum portion of contracted labor opportunities for local communities, minimum portion of contracted labor opportunities for traditionally disadvantaged groups, uh, transfer of skills and knowledge, is, knowledge to uh, local beneficiaries, for example, labor opportunities for women. We're trying to incorporate those as much as possible, but it's still fairly early on in the process. Um, and we'll be working uh, with suppliers to see how we can improve that in the future. UNICEF is also uh, just about to embark on a, an e-tendering system, which is uh, similar to the one used in some other agencies. Um, we're using it in some offices already, including Geneva, and now the supply division in Copenhagen is rolling out an e-tendering solution, which will hopefully lead to uh, a much more uh, sustainable way of, uh, of bidding, so reduction of paper, much more efficient process, etc. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, and um, I think I'm going to pass it on to um, George in here and his uh, thoughts on this. Yep. Um, well, the, the SDG process in general is is more to change UN's attitude to help governments and to actually implement, uh, give initiative to governments to implement what is their initiative and help them to implement that. So obviously that changes a lot in terms of programmatic aspects of UN and as, as soon as programmatic aspects change, of course, the procurement aspects change. One of the things that WFP changed, actually WFP changed almost all of its structure to respond to SDGs. Uh, we are in the middle of change for the moment. Uh, in, we call it inter integrated roadmap, but basically it's, uh, it's changing whole way of how we work. Um, in terms of procurement, one of, the, one of the examples would be that WFP is more looking for uh, towards the food assistance rather than food aid. What means that we provide more nutritious food uh, to, to beneficiaries rather than just, just grains, cereals. We provide more spe special food for kids, uh, especially those that are stunted. This is coming from governments. This is their requirement that we help, uh, help them on this area. Obviously, this type of programmatic change changes the requirement to buy food. We are now buying more uh, highly nutritious foods, let's say. We are, we changed, changed on that a lot. The moment you change the food buying pattern, you need to change your transportation and storage pattern because some foods need cold storage. So we, we had to change the whole logistics pattern as well. So, you know, it changed a lot. Uh, in WFP in terms of procurement. That's the question. I mean, these are the changes that has happened so far, and I foresee even more changes coming as we will go in more advising the governments. Uh, so our uh, non-food procurement will be more like consultancy type, uh, giving the experience. So we will have to buy a completely different set of services, especially, and goods maybe, uh, related to SDG, uh, change of SDGs or switching to SDGs. Thank you so much, George. And um, I would like to say thank you to our audience. We, we have received a lot of questions today, but unfortunately we, uh, we have run out of time. So uh, what we can do is we're going to pass on these, we're going to pass these questions on to our panelists and hopefully they'll be able to uh, get back to you and respond to all your, um, your questions. And uh, this is all for today. And thank you very much, everyone any questions again and thank you very much to our speakers Niara, Jacqueline and George and uh, if you would like to find out more about our webinars or have any suggestions for future topics or speakers we would love to hear from you and um, I would also like to take this time to remind everyone that you can get the, uh, the opportunity to meet procurement professionals at our summits and the, uh, the next one will be uh, in Myanmar our aid and development Asia summit which Niara is participating at and uh, our Global Disaster Relief and Development Summit returns to Washington this September with its ninth edition. You can get more information and regular updates on our webpage at www.aforum.org. And uh, a, big thank, a big thank you from uh, the ADAF team, and uh, goodbye, and uh, until the uh, next time, thank you so much.